views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. We've got a bit of a different show and a nice surprise for you tonight. People have heard of the Woodlawn Cemetery, of course, and many have a sense, yeah, I heard they have some well-known people buried there. That, of course, would be quite an understatement. Also, of course, many other Bronxites have been on their tours and attended their events and know firsthand that Woodlawn Cemetery is one of the most vibrant and active organizations in the Bronx, providing, yes, intrigue about the legacy of the past, as well as a proper and dignified place to memorialize loved ones. But also, they know that Woodlawn Cemetery looks to the future, with internships, educational activities, a legacy program, a variety of tours and programs, and even just yesterday, they had a knockout jazz concert on their grounds attended by hundreds. So for the first time in our legacy of 23 plus years on Bronx Talk, we're going to take a moment to look at the Woodlawn Cemetery. And we have a special guest tonight who will illustrate very clearly the more than just a cemetery concept. We'll introduce him in just a moment. We will start with the uh, cemetery's executive director. It is David Eisen. Nice to have you with us, sir. Thanks, Karen. And I want to introduce the second guest. Maybe people recognize him when they see him, but we have a video to show. So let it rip. behind the net, swings it in front, he scores! Metto, 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 Stefan Metto, and the Rangers have one more hill to climb, baby, but it's not Vancouver, the Rangers are headed to the... All right, there you go, I, I will applaud as a Ranger fan, Stefan Matteau is with us. Uh, nice to have you with us, sir. Thanks for having uh, me. How many times have you seen that? Never uh, enough? First time today, but I've <laughs> seen it thousands and thousands. I don't get uh, tired of it. And, and as I mentioned to you, I was actually at that first one, uh, the double overtime against um, the Devils. I think I'm going to put you on hold. We'll put you in the penalty box for Perfect. a minute or so. And uh, we're going to talk to Mr. Eisen and get an idea about the cemetery, and then we'll uh, focus in on what you are here for. Um, Woodlawn Cemetery is an amazing place. Talk to me, I mean, I was just looking and, and I just pulled it off the web. Some of the names, Herman Melville, F.W. Woolworth, Duke Ellington, Fiorello LaGuardia, just every, and, and some names came up here. You said the, the original owner of the Rangers is buried there. Just talk to me about kind of the scope of what Woodlawn Cemetery has been and is. You know, with Woodlawn's vast history of, you know, Pretty much anybody that was somebody in New York, the people that built, you know, New York, are buried at Woodlawn, and you know, the names that you just read off, uh, you know, and it's not just we have, you know, one, you know, certain area. Um, you know, there's all kinds of genres. Is we have the jazz greats: Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, Illinois Jaquette, of course, Herman Melville. Of course, we could sit here for twenty, uh, for could. thirty minutes and Absolutely. review them all. <laughs> yeah, and you know, as you mentioned, Tex Rickard, uh, he was the original owner of the New York Rangers, and that kind of got my interest peaked about the New York Rangers and uh, their organization, which ultimately led to meeting up with Steph. So. Um, why have so many well-known people been buried there? I understand that many of the musicians were there because Duke Ellington was buried there and they said, we want to be with him. Was it like that, for example, for writers or business people? Or is it just one thing added up and they said, this is where we want to go and, you know, for internment? Well, you, when you look at it, uh, the two major cemeteries, uh, Greenwood over in Brooklyn and Woodlawn in the Bronx, um, Woodlawn was actually, a significant piece of land was purchased due to the proximity of the railroad. 
uh, because Manhattan was getting larger. There wasn't a lot of land for people to be buried in Manhattan. So they could actually be buried um, in Woodlawn and have a large tract of land. Uh, they could have their uh, architects design their mausoleums. They could have their um, you know, landscape architects design the landscaping around them. So they could have their own plot designed by the people that actually designed many of the buildings in Manhattan. Hmm. Uh, you know, some of the numbers, 300,000 are interred there. Yeah. There are 150,000 monuments. I mean, it's startling. It's amazing. Um, uh, 1,300 mausoleums. Um, how, give us some numbers. How large is, is Woodlawn Cemetery? It would, you know, people drive by it like I have or walk by it, and you, you don't get a sense of the, the magnitude of it. It's extraordinarily large. Yeah, to, to give you an idea, it's, it's 400 acres, which is half the size of Central Park. So that, if you can kind of visualize wow. the, the size of Central Park and think half that size. So it's, it's large. Mm -hmm. um, among the, listen, uh, we all have loved ones and we bury loved ones and we visit their cemeteries, either for the funeral or even afterwards. It's, the place is meticulous. It, it, all of the, the graves and the gravestones are incredibly well kept. Talk to me about uh, what it takes to do that, and then of course we can start moving into the idea of your educational programs, yeah. because you do have um, help, so to speak, from the young people in the Bronx. Well, yeah, I think first of all, you know, with all the programs that we have, and the fact that Woodlawn, you know, is more than a cemetery, but ultimately our core business is being a cemetery. And you know, Woodlawn is owned by our property owners. So we have an obligation to our property owners to make sure it looks good, um, actually better than good, um, when you look at the trees, um, when you look at the plants. And you know, we're constantly developing new areas. Um, you may see on TV that, or in the newspapers that many of the cemeteries are actually running out of space. Um, we're working through now strategic planning to where we can go another 50 to 60 years wow. by managing the actual space that we have and developing you know, for the future. There, there, so there still is space, and that is, is something I know it's important to, yeah. to you folks to talk about. It's not just about the past, and certainly we're going to talk with uh, Stefan Matteau about the present and the future. Um, there's, there still is space. This is an yes. active cemetery. Yeah. Families, or I mean, you, you don't have to be Herman Melville to mm -hmm. um, uh, be interned and, and be working with the people at um, Woodland Cemetery. Yeah, you know, we currently um, serve about um, 900 families a year that actually bury uh, loved ones, and then we have another thousand a year that actually pre-plan for themselves. You know, pre-planning is something that's coming more and more um, prominent nowadays because people want to make sure that everything's um, taken care of ahead of time so they don't leave it for their families. Um, you know, by doing it ahead of time, you can do payments. Um, you can select exactly what you want so your family knows and, that and you're potentially which potentially where you want Absolutely. because you've got space and those yeah. kinds of things. Yes. And so those dialogues, you, I, I assume you and your colleagues do every day. Yes, every day. Um, I, I want to bring um, Stefan into the um, conversation. Talk to me about, I mean, I said it and made a big deal of it at the beginning of the show about all the activities. Why would a cemetery, I mean, I'm not aware of, I don't know what other cemeteries do. I'm a Bronx guy, but I'm not aware of any other cemetery that is as active. Every event I go to, I meet people who are from Woodlawn Cemetery. You are participate in everything you can, it seems to me, in the Bronx. Why, why do you do that, and is that an unusual fit for a cemetery? Well, years ago, we started our Friends of Woodlawn, which is now the Woodlawn Conservancy, and all of our programs fall underneath that. And we, we started that uh, particular business to preserve the future of the cemetery. And all the educational programs that we do, whether it be our preservation training program for 18 to 24 year olds that learn um, job skills by learning how to clean monuments and uh, whether it's bringing kids out from field trips that they can learn about the great legacies that are buried at Woodlawn or the legacy program that where we actually teach kids that they actually have their own legacy. That's what the guy to your right is going to talk about. Yeah. Um, uh, let, let's uh, bring him in the conversation. I'll let you, in essence, in, other than the, the incredible moments that he had with the New York Rangers in 1994, um, g give us a bit of introduction. How did it cover? We were joking beforehand. You know, we have a cemetery. <laughs> you can reach out to a hockey player, a guy from, uh, you know, French, a French Canadian from Montreal, is now kind of a central figure in one of the programs you run. How did that come about? Well, I mean, when you look at it, like I said earlier, bringing a French Canadian into the Bronx, <laughs> uh, teaching kids about legacy, 
using a cemetery as a backdrop. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a perfect could, fit. Who, how you could know? you not think about it? How could you not yeah. imagine that? But now, you know, about uh, a year and a half ago, um, I had a chance to meet Steph uh, through a mutual uh, third party. And I had always, you know, grown up playing sports. And sports was a big part of my life. And just listening to my heroes talk and learn from them and think about my legacy. And then I had a chance to come to Woodlawn. And when you look at the number of legacies that are buried there, so I had this idea that why don't we take um, the legacies that are buried at Woodlawn and teach kids that they have their own legacy. You know, whether you're 12 years old, you're still 12 years into your legacy. And when you look at an athlete or um, some type of celebrity in New York, what better person to look at than one of the greatest moments in sports history Certainly in New, New York. York sports history, Absolutely, yeah. New York, yeah. Well, and, and he says one of the moments, I, I fingered the two moments, and he was very uh, clear that they really were those two uh, great goals. And so then one thing led to the other. Yeah. Nice to have you with us here. Thanks in the for Bronx. having me. Thank you. Um, we were talking about it before the show. What's it been like? Uh, and you are from Montreal, Canada. When you come to New York and you work in New York, you meet kids. What's it been like? It's just been amazing. It's been a journey, and it's only been a year so far with those kids. But uh, every time I step to those classes, it just, uh, I learned so much from them. They think I, I teach them something, but they, I, I, they're teaching I, you. They're te teaching me, and it just feels good to, to go back home and share that with my wife and my kids, what I've been doing in the Bronx. And uh, it's just been a great journey so far. I mean, it's just the beginning. Talk, talk to me about what, and you're wearing the shirt for it. What is the Student Leadership and Legacy Program at Woodlawn? Well, State? I want to share with the kids what I've experienced in my life. I was one of the shy kids uh, when I was their age. I was, I got bullied. I was, uh, I was the, uh, I was good at sports, and that's what saved me. And I could relate to those kids. And I asked them, what's, what's their legacy? And some of them, the, they don't know their it legacy. It never occurred to them. It never occurred to them. So why would a, a French Canadian come up and ask them the question? But they, after f 10, 15 minutes in the classroom spending with them, they realize, well, they, you can be kind to your teachers, you could be kind to your parents, and, and your, your siblings, your friends, and they're everywhere. And they realize, well, we do have a legacy. And that, then we talk about it, and we just keep on going. For, for an athlete and a former athlete looking for things, I mean, obviously you had a lot of meaning in your life. You yeah. played in the NHL for 13 years. This must be very rewarding to say, well, my experience as a professional athlete, I can now really communicate something about that that might help uh, young people do better. Absolutely. I, was, uh, I didn't know what to do at the end of my career, and I met someone from uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and we started a program like that in Lancaster for the last eight years. And, uh, but this time with David and his group and uh, the teachers that we're working with, they are, we're working with the, uh, not trouble kids, with trouble, we, we're working with leaderships and uh, some good kids, and they have 90% uh, 90 average, and they, uh, it's amazing to how they are amazing just to talk to them and uh, we get their parents to come into the classroom. It's very magical. It's hard to talk about it, but once, once you experience once in their classroom, you realize how great it is. So then uh, we're going to go the easy route. We're going to uh, take a shortcut and we're going to show a video. There's a video that the Woodlawn Cemetery put together of Stefan Matteau in a classroom. And I'll tell you, when I saw it the first time, I was like, wait a minute. Just like you said, a <laughs> French Canadian in a Bronx classroom put together by a cemetery. So let's take a, take a moment. We're going to watch uh, Stefan Matteau with the uh, a Student Leadership and Legacy Program at Woodlawn Cemetery. And then uh, we'll be right back. So enjoy. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Coach Matteau. Welcome to the Woodlawn Student Leadership and Legacy Playbook. Most people think about my legacy. It's about the overtime goals that I scored, but it's much more than that. I moved out of my house when I was 15 years old. I was petrified. <laughs> I uh, wanted to create a, a program that the kids can find out about their own legacy. After defining your strengths, the next step is to pinpoint areas for growth. So many of the greats that made New York City what it is are buried at Woodlawn. So when you look at the great moments in sports, why would you look anywhere else other than Mateau, Mateau, Mateau? Coach Mateau helps the students feel that they can be safe in this environment by expressing his own feelings, expressing that, that it's hard for him to express his feelings. I grew up as a shy person and uh, I overcome that. I wanted to create a classroom, an environment that the kids can come in here and they can share their stories, whether it's good or bad. 
And what we're trying to do is to get these kids to connect with somebody from the past. Look at what she accomplished. And be able to recognize those leadership skills that those people possessed. What we learned from his story was that he didn't start off rich. And then dig within themselves and find out what leadership qualities that they have and to realize that they don't have to be a Herman Melville, a Celia Cruz, they could just be themselves. In everyone's grade school, that dash there, that represents their legacy. It's not just about how much work you put in, it's about being able to treat others how you'd like to be treated. I thought that you had to do like something extraordinary. You just need to be yourself and be a good person. You can have a meaningful legacy by being a good student, by being a good brother, sister, a citizen. This has already had such a great impact on all of us, building a community and creating conversation around legacy and leadership. What will be your legacy? All right, there you go, Stefan Matteau in the Bronx classroom. Um, Talk to me about kind of the journey some of the kids make. When you start with them, they don't think about their legacy. You've admitted that. But then afterwards, you have kids saying, hey, I want to be this, or this would be a nice thing. Is there anybody or anything that sticks in your mind that makes you say, wow, I really did make an impression on them? Well, the first time we step into their classroom, they look at me, first of all, I'm six foot four, 250 <laughs> pounds, and no hair, and they, I'm the former NHL you, you player. Speak French. And, Speaks yeah, French right, with right, a I thick know. accent, and it's, uh, I'm very comfortable with that. But uh, they, they looked at me strangely the, the first half an hour. And then when I, when I, because I open up pretty easy, I'm very easy to talk to kids, to, 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 the, to the parents and the, the, mm -hmm. um, the teachers. And then I get comfortable, they get comfortable. And then we start, we have a questionnaires, we have some personal questions. They don't have to answer any, any of our questions, but they open up uh, very quickly because mm -hmm. I open up. And it's very strange, like, uh, do we see the transformation from the first period, the second period, and the third period? And, and so is there an, a quick anecdote you can give me about a youngster who you thought, gee, this person doesn't have a lot to say, and then the next thing you know, he or she came out and said, you know, I'm going to be the governor or something like that. But was one kid who didn't say much, and I, 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 we met that person's aunt uh, at uh, Steiner Sport, and, they should, and I thought we didn't have an impact. And... Uh, he shared with her that he had such a great time. The three times we met, we met with, uh, with, with him, and it just like they don't say much. Some of them are very outspoken. Some of them on the video, they just, every time we step back to their P uh, P19, they did they welcome PS19. Welcomed, 19, yeah. PS 19, they really like us, and they uh, so it's hard to to know the impact that we have on them, but. Uh, they have an impact on me and David, and we... I'm uh, sure there's a lot of going back. Uh, you want to mention yeah, something? Yeah, please I, do. I think that please do. probably one of my... Thanks, Steph. Think, <laughs> he uh, still is a shy boy from yes, Montreal, yes. let's face it. Yeah. I think probably one of my favorite moments was uh, with the first group we did, and we were on the second period. Um, the kids have had to pick a Woodlawn legacy, and they have to study about the leadership qualities that that person possessed. And we had one young African-American girl that selected Madam C.J. Walker, mm -hmm. who happened to be the first woman millionaire. And I remember standing at Madam C.J. Walker's gravesite with her, and it was on that film, and um, she had her notes, and she had studied and researched, and she said, you know, before Martin Luther King started the movement, and before Rosa Parks wouldn't give up her place on the, the bus, uh, this woman was doing what everybody told her she couldn't do. They said, you can't do it because you're black. You can't do it because you're a woman. And because of her, I can do anything I want to be. Wow. And that moment that's, that's was That's really the answer just, to the question I was asking. Yeah, that moment was just amazing for me. I, you know, I, maybe it's obvious. Um, obviously, a, a cemetery is a place for dead people. Um, but this really makes it come alive. So if you have all these well-known people, why not use them to teach lessons? Absolutely. Right? Um, let, let's talk about another side of um, which, which gets us away from some of these programs, but into this idea that uh, are more people looking to cremate, uh, you know, their their family members or themselves? Uh, is is that a trend now in in, um, in 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 your business? It is, and I think really uh, this is. this year uh, marked the first year that uh, cremation uh, reached the fifty percent threshold in the United States. Um, some areas are, you know, it's more prevalent than other areas. I mean, you'd think like uh, uh, Wyoming. You'd think Wyoming, for example, um, cremation wouldn't be so prevalent, but it's one of the highest rated wow. cremations because it's transient. You've got the natural gas boom. So cremation 
and the popularity is based on several things. You know, one, um, in some instances, it can be cheaper. Um, in other instances, it, if there's no family around, um, in some ways, death has become inconvenient for families, and they'll cremate. Um, and less wait. expensive? It can be less expensive. Be. Um, <clears throat> and I, I just want to interject, some of the photos we showed, you have yeah. cremation plots or m memorials uh, yes. as ways yeah. of, of, of you know, having people have a standard place for them, their family members. Yeah, well, because as cremation's evolved, um, so many people that have cremated mm -hmm. and not had a service, not had any type of memorialization, and we've found that they maybe regretted that. So cremation, now we're seeing a trend of wanting to have some type of a service, uh, which the funeral directors you know, can provide, and then wanting to have some place to come visit. So we've had to come up with uh, different ways to memorialize someone's cremated remains. We were talking before the show, and you were talking about your background and part of the reason you got into yeah. this, and you've been doing this for a very long time, is because the idea of helping families. I mean, this is obviously a very difficult moment for people and their families, mm -hmm. and that's a notion you take very seriously. And so if there's a new trend, I'm just guessing that you say, well, then, then, then we've got to follow the trend rather than force them into something else. Yeah, and I think the Internet, um, you know, Families all the time are seeing something that may be done in California or maybe done in Minnesota or Paris. And you know, one of the things we are always doing is looking for ways that we can um, increase our options for memorialization. And we kind of have a phrase I've coined that you know, families really don't necessarily know what they want with cremation, but when they know it, well, when they see it, they know it. So That's we'll take them around and show them all the options. You know, you saw our uh, Brookside um, garden with the nice brook going through it with the rocks that we've cored for cremated remains to be placed in. You know, many cremation families like the more natural state. Mm -hmm. We also have what's called glass front niches to where the urn can be placed behind the glass and they can put family mementos. Maybe it's a fishing lure of granddad's. Maybe it's a Yankees baseball. And so even if they they choose to go that route, there yes. are ways to still do some personalize of the, it. Personalize it. Yeah. That's a very good way of putting it. Let's go back to some of the programs. You have um, one of the things you didn't mention, which I, I'm aware of, you have young people learning um, masonry trades so that they can preserve some of the stones yeah. and things like that. So, some of that stuff is, frankly, is fascinating. Yes. And, of course, in the Bronx, we're always looking for jobs and opportunities for kids that, I, you know, what can I tell you? This is, this is yeah. how you got to do it. And, I mean, when you're, when you're walking through the streets of New York City, you're, you always see scaffolding, and you always <clears> see <throat> buildings that are being repaired or need repaired. And there's really a shortage of the people to go into those jobs. So when you look at the buildings in, in say, Manhattan, uh, the same people that built those buildings and built the buildings in the Bronx built the mausoleums at Woodlawn. So what better place to train... The Piccarilli brothers. Absolutely. What better place to train these young kids that really maybe don't know what they want to do in life and they just got out of high school because all the kids are 18 to 24 years old. We have a you know, master craftsman that teaches them the trait. And you know, it's a 90-day uh, program. Uh, we just had a graduation. And uh, you know, we've actually, it's been great because we've had some of the Ranger guys, uh, other than Steph, even come in and, and work with the kids. Uh, you, know, you just showed a picture of Ron Duguay and mm -hmm. uh, Colt Nord had come in. And one day we even had, we had Steph up on the, you know, what, 40 feet up in the air with oh, uh, power washer <laughs> and you know he was up there interacting with the kids and you know these guys and showing that it's okay to yeah. do it. Um, before we run out of time there there's a question I want to ask you and that it cuts right to the core of who you are and what your experience is as well as what you can teach young people what, what do you learn from being a professional athlete from from being in sports that is a lesson that you've been able to communicate to the young people? In other words, what, what in your experience is useful in that dialogue? I wish I could go back 25 years ago. <laughs> Don't we all? And I'd like to go back and see that game again. We won in triple overtime, double overtime. I can teach the kids, doesn't matter what, uh, what great moments you can do in sports, you have to stay humble and uh, be a good father, being a good uh, brother, and it's just something that I take that very, pr I'm very proud of, uh, I'm a good, like, I'm that's a good. That's your legacy. I'm, that's my legacy, I'm a good person, and I wanted to share that with the kids, it doesn't matter if you're an athlete, that, that goal led me to Woodlawn, 
but uh, the rest is I have to, uh, and I'm working on my legacy, and my legacy, my legacy, our legacy changes every single day, so. And, and so you, you know that we all know that he scored that goal, although I like to mention the two goals that we, we, we showed, um, but you scored that, that goal, which we all call your name three times, Matteau, yeah. Matteau, Matteau, but you're saying that there's more to life than just that. Obviously, they uh, then, yeah. Um, David, let's uh, just review um, what's next for the, the now we ha you had the big jazz concert, I guess just ongoing tours and yes. all kinds of bringing education. It's a wonderful resource for the Bronx and for all of New York. Well, I, I'll make an announcement tonight. Yeah, let's um, go. Drum roll, please. The uh, September 29th weekend, it's confirmed. Um, probably one of the most visited grave sites at Woodlawn is Soya Cruz. Um, we are going to be bringing in her dresses, wow. her wigs, her shoes, and we're going to be turning in our Woolworth Chapel into a museum. And we'll have the trolley taking people from her gravesite back and forth. And then we're also going to have uh, uh, some music set up at her gravesite with hopefully the City of Cruz High School we're reaching wow. out to. So it's going to be a big event. That, that is wonderful. I saw what you just pulled out of the bag. What is that? It's a little gift for you. Wow. I know I noticed that you have the Mark Messi. I want you, uh, we wanted you to wow. have the, the Matteau jersey. And it's... Thank you so no, much. Thank you for so having I, us. So I have, as I, I showed Stefan, that I had the, oh my goodness gracious, talk about, it. here we go. This is Bronx Talk, boy. <laughs> my, my director just said, oh, that's nice, Gary. I like yeah. it. Wow, thank you no, thank so Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Wow. And I'm happy, to, I'm proud to say it's actually autographed on the back of, mm -hmm. uh, of the jersey. Stefan, thank you so much. Well, this is part of your legacy, being able to bring joy and happiness to a, a Ranger fan. I see my producers taking pictures. Um, and what's next for you? Do you go to schools regularly? And uh, we, I'm, uh, I'm blown away by this. Thank we started so with one school a year ago. We, then we skipped to four, eight. Now we're doing 18 schools. And I'm, tomorrow I'm going back at it. Uh, to two schools a day, and in September we're going to do maybe 40 to 50 schools wow. in the Bronx. How, um, uh, how many days or how, how often are you in the Bronx? About uh, 10 days in the month. 10 yeah. days in the month. Yeah, so five days, and uh, wow. I go back, I drive back to Montreal. Drive back and forth. And last week, two weeks ago, my daughter came with me. I wanted to share that with her, and uh, what a great experience. David Eisen, thank you for uh, you know bringing the dead people at Woodlawn <laughs> alive, really, and yeah. keeping legacy alive. And Stefan Matteau, I, I got to tell you, thank you so much for the jersey. My goodness gracious! Thank you very yes. much. And um, you, you, uh, you, you, you were asking about uh, you know go to woodlawntours.org and you can see any of the uh, events that we have scheduled. Yes, woodlawntours.org. Yeah. Listen, all you got to do is go Google Woodlawn, Woodlawn Cemetery. Cemetery. It all comes yeah. up. And if you Google Stefan Matteau, you can say that Gary Axelbank is going to be wearing his jersey all the time. Uh, gentlemen, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. And uh, folks, you. if you have further questions or comments on anything you heard on the show tonight or anything going on in the Bronx, you email them to us at bronxtalk, bronxnet.org. We'll send it to Stefan Matteau if you want to ask him anything. You can send a tweet at the Bronx Talk or post them on our Facebook page, and we'll read them on the air during a future edition of our program. Our archives, uh, that's our legacy. Uh, are at bronxnet.org. you find Bronx Talk by following the watch menu on the new BronxNet website. We thank our producer, who's Helen. Our director is William. And we say good night. And let's go Rangers. Next year, new coach, maybe good things. <laughs>